You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. And I have Dr. Indra Sadambi. Uh, she works at the uh, in, an, in addiction medicine at the Center for Network Therapy. Uh, she's recognized as a leading expert pioneer in the field of addiction medicine. And she founded the Center for Network Therapy, uh, New Jersey's first state licensed ambulatory, which means outpatient detoxification care and treatment facility. And she's serving currently as a medical director. So, uh, Dr. Sadambi, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Good. Thank you, Richard for inviting me to the podcast program today. Yeah, what, uh, what got you interested in addiction medicine in the first place? Um, well, during my psychiatric residency, I had an opportunity to rotate through an addiction treatment program, and uh, that's when I found that this field was interesting because where I got my training, they did not have the addiction um, training in depth. So we were asked to go from Maimonides, which is in uh, Brooklyn, um, to go to Coney Island Hospital to get the rotation. So it kind of made me feel that something which I was afraid of, like every time when I was on call, I didn't want to have to deal with an addicted um, patient coming in because I didn't know what to do with the patient. So once I had that rotation of training from Coney Island, it kind of made, made me feel comfortable. I thought I kind of conquered the world or something. No longer have to have the oh. fear. So that was my huh. interest. <laughs> yes, that's how I got been, into I've been to Coney Island and... Coney Island itself can, I guess, just make a bad joke. <laughs> yes. That's a good place. Okay. So so what, um, what about it? I mean, you were afraid. It was a personal challenge for you to overcome it, which is great. But then what uh, what kept you working there and what kept you wanting to be involved in it? Uh, because I, I started feeling that not everyone who suffers from the disease of addiction is able to access treatment. That was the first thing that I came to conclusion, like, you know, I have to come to that concept that not everyone who suffers is able to access treatment. Being a physician, that was very hard for me to digest. The result is that we see so many uh, preventable overdose deaths that keeps happening. I would like that to change. So I think reducing stigma associated with the disease of addiction and moving more treatment to an outpatient setting will greatly increase the access to care. Uh, so that became my goal and my vision. And so I introduced the concept of outpatient detoxification. Most of it is uh, mostly in an inpatient setting. So that so many people who had the stigma and where the insurance did not cover those uh, inpatient treatment, they were able to access treatment at an appropriate time. So that was um, the vision and the mission for so what are, what are some of the traditional inpatient treatments? And then you know, I want to discuss how yours is. Oh, okay. Um, traditional model is inpatient. Inpatient model, I have to admit that uh, once someone gets um, to be diagnosed with addictive disorders, they were asked to go away uh, in, to be in an inpatient setting to sober up. And then when they step down to an outpatient um, clinic, by the time they would go back to an outpatient treatment, they would relapse and again either uh, have an overdose and death and or get revived, um, you know, because of their tolerance has gone down. So that's what makes it tricky when they have to do an inpatient treatment. So I thought this outpatient model is wonderful in that it incorporates everything, like their stress is still being addressed while they are in treatment. And so they are not like stepping down dramatically from a fully structured environment to their back to their chaotic environment. So that's uh, that's the positive outlook. And what uh, what drugs require significant intervention? And which ones don't seem to be as harmful? You know, if you compare alcoholism, you know, addiction to heroin or meth, you know, what's it like amidst the different drugs and substances? So in terms of the detoxification, I would say 
there is a challenge when we we are detoxing anybody who is abusing alcohol and or benzodiazepines because it's life threatening people can die when they are detoxing off of too so but then um opioids as much as we say it is so like abusing heroin from detoxification nobody will die and so it's not a big risk to detoxify them at an outpatient level but then having uh, worked at an outpatient um detox center for close to 7 years now i can tell you more than 60% of the patients can be easily detoxed as an outpatient so uh, what kind of trends are you seeing in drug addiction use is it more prescriptions like oxycontin methadone or is it more illegal drugs what do you see so it, uh, there was a big uh, change in the whole spectrum uh, you know earlier in my career i saw like a lot of uh, patients were using prescription drugs it was always like pain medication but then due to the loud noise in the past one and a half years uh, the prescription pain pills uh, has been reduced and uh, but then sadly enough there are so many people using straight heroin and the heroin is tainted with uh, fentanyl and so you do see that mishap of overdose and death and so that's a sad thing and not only that you know people who are buying pills online like they would get some Xanax like which is a anti anxiety medication and they would think they were taking Xanax which they bought online but then when we drug test them um they would come out positive for fentanyl and when we confront them they would say i did not do anything but for this pill and so hmm. it's scary you know yeah it is no it's like you're damned if you do it you're damned if you don't you can yes. buy drugs from uh, so is this people buying drugs from the dark web or canadian pharmacies or where would uh, where do people get these pills it it depends you know mostly the kids uh, between the ages of 19 and 25 i would see those patients are like constantly you know talking about the dark web and i even had one patient teach me how to get on and off like you know how to order stuff and i was like taken aback that was like a short uh, brief course that he gave me so for me to understand how we did it which that's the only way for as an addiction psychiatrist i can really learn stuff otherwise we don't have books or not did we get trained to this extent it's quite an evolving and a challenging field i come to realize and so that's uh, something that you see in that age group moving along like you know people in their mid 30s and to into 40s they go um, somewhat justifying what they buy online from online pharmacies and stuff like that and you know older than that those who have enough money they would be like buying kratom and think oh this is something i can help myself to come off of opioids only to know that kratom is um, you know again an addictive substance like opioids and so Hmm. you know it's just a challenge now one after the other they'll come in and tell you like i didn't even know this was um addictive yeah huh. it might be obvious but what is challenging about it is it that a lot of these drugs have a very high relapse rate or is it that the uh, i don't know the people themselves just mentally they maybe they want to quit but they can't i mean what are the the big challenges in helping people? Uh, i see that there are misconception there are myths that the public has already uh, formed in their head about addiction and then the challenge about having stigma attached to substance use so you know continuing uh, where where i was um, you know touching upon a long time misconception we can see that addiction was a behavior issue and not a disease that's where it all started people used to say just go to 12 step meetings and uh, you should have your will power don't take any medication so it's not a disease it's all what you wanted to do so you made the mistake you should correct it that was the first misconception that they had and i think the dominance has been that addiction was a behavior issue and not a disease and now mm. then the patient inpatient model came from that from this belief the need to isolate individuals suffering from this disease from the society until they learn to change uh, the way they behave so but now addiction has been proved uh, to be a disease and it's a, it's treated like a chronic disease so why is this inpatient treatment still dominating you know that is my biggest uh, question and i would i would say that investments already made by inpatient providers in the inpatient model um keeps it going because they put in so much money they don't want to say now addiction can easily be treated as an outpatient but i think inpatient treatment also keeps the stigma associated with the addiction going um, so if someone gets caught by the loved ones now they have to like get isolated they need to 
get away from the family that means they need to explain to the children and to the other family members like siblings you know and also to talk about this to their um, employers when they come back the missing days you know so there's so much of stigma associated so what's the difference between um inpatient versus what you do so what are some of the key differences? essentially my model which is the ambulatory detox is is totally an outpatient model it's an enabled individual suffering from addiction to access treatment from their living environment um i have found it to be power- powerful just think about it you know there is um little stigma associated with treatment as you are not sent away from home for a long period of time and then you also see that um you you get to learn to stay sober in your own living environment so we have found it delivers far better results compared to the inpatient treatment when i say that richard it's like 65% of our patient are sober over 90 days uh, when you compare that to an inpatient it's 40% so you do see a dramatic oh, wow. um, success rate with this model but what are some of the key elements that help people with addiction like what kind of things do they do whether it's inpatient or outpatient what are the common things that they need to do number one thing is that uh, you know addressing the myth and saying that i need to hit rock bottom in order to get treatment that's not true um anybody with this chronic disease if they embrace this as a chronic disease it we they can really look at it the way they will look at any other chronic illnesses like diabetes or high blood pressure and say hey i have a problem there is a solution to it let me go there is no cure but there is a fix so once they are in that boat uh it then it gets easier they need to seek for a proper treatment the number one step will be to detox themselves from the medication uh, with the help of a professional and then uh, you know the problem again is after the detox a patient might say i can do this i'm no longer using i'm all cured um so that's a pitfall again and so they need to like continue with the treatment which is the partial care um the partial care is where they will be getting treatment for other comorbidities what i mean by that uh, if they have any medical issues and or the psychiatric issues like the depression and anxiety needs to be addressed in the partial care and then they go down to an intensive outpatient clinic which will be the evening program and or the daytime program depending upon where you know who provides that and once they are enrolled in that they'll be like they will go back to work and they will um, integrate their daily lifestyle with the treatment model so that teaches them a healthy coping skills and also going on a medication assisted treatment which is a huge um, pushback from the community because most people who have recovered treat addicted patients and so those who are in recovery as a therapist and or the treatment providers they would say um you don't have to take any medication because you're going to substitute one medication for the other and so this this has been a challenge again so i think going through detox partial care intensive outpatient and staying on a medication assisted program will definitely show improvement in, with anybody who has been addicted to drugs and or alcohol so physically and mentally i would assume that detox is the hardest part at the beginning that's true that's true and they are also in such a huge denial they don't want to do it and they are not feeling good physically and it's a stigma and everything put together and so i you know that's one of the reasons why i um you know chose the outpatient ambulatory model so that kind of gives that person who's suffering from addiction some control and i always tell my patients believe it or not you are the driver me as a treating physician is just a navigator so i'll be annoying you but you make your own decisions so that makes it much more palatable like they they are comfortable with that model do you notice that um when people come in is it is it a big component that they feel bad about themselves like they just have no self control and they're a loser and all that because of what society says about addicts yeah they they come in with three things they come in with the guilt they come in with you know the feeling that they blame themselves for everything and then they feel also self pity like you know my family uh, really does not understand me the trust issues so i need to work on so at the end of the day they just feel that they are not worth anything and so we need to work on showing their strength and then you know point to them that this addiction is just a faulty coping skill so once they learn that we we see the improvement in uh the treatment then they show a dramatic impact okay. um how long is the program typically is it individual where everyone's totally different or is it tend to go along a certain path so 
So one size does not fit all. Having said that, I would also say if it is just a single drug and or an alcohol, it will be a shorter period of time. So if someone just uses opiate, then it's just a seven to eight days of an outpatient ambulatory detox. After they are detoxed from the medication, then they move on to two weeks of Monday through Friday, um, 9 to 3 p.m. of partial care. And then they step down to IOP, which is an intensive outpatient, three times a week, or some places they would offer it for four times a week, uh, three hours each day. So it can be either in the daytime or in the evening, depending upon what are the needs of the patient. If somebody is working day daytime, they would prefer coming to an evening program, or some people work evening, so they would go to a daytime program. So that's what is expected in, in terms of single drug and or alcohol. But if they are mixing, say, alcohol with benzodiazepine, that might add a couple of days. You know, that's pretty much the norm. How does someone detox go on an outpatient basis? I mean, I would guess maybe what the first night is the hardest? or We medicate it so well that they don't feel um, any bump. It's not that, you know, what is challenging for an outpatient model is that, you know, the person who has been using, uh, you know, comes for treatment and then goes back to his own environment where they have been using to start with. That is a challenge. So you don't want that person going back home where they were using last night. Uh, maybe they have leftover heroin and or alcohol. So we have to uh, bring in the family, educate them and tell them like this needs to be removed from the house so there is no access. And then also teach them about the medication that they took in the ambulatory detoxification program and say what are the fall precautions and stuff like that. So giving them a good understanding of what to expect makes it much easier. It's not challenging as you would think. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy. Like we have been doing this and people are different age group. I would even say 60, 70 years of age. They're very comfortable going through this ambulatory talk. So what kinds of medications do people have in various situations and what does it do to them? How do they work? So um, ambulatory detox is no different from the inpatient detox in terms of um, the medication. The way it works is that we store medication in-house. So it feels like when a patient comes in, they get an evaluation done and we start medicating them right away so they don't have to wait. And that is one of the biggest concerns because when you take someone for inpatient, they get the evaluation, they're waiting to be admitted to the unit. And so they bring in their own drugs and sneak it in the bathroom and take them there too um, because they don't, they are afraid of going through withdrawal. So that has been eliminated in an ambulatory detoxity. So they get medicated right away. And then we monitor them the whole day. And uh, we use the similar medication that they use in inpatient detoxification. For example, if we are dealing with opiates, we do use Suboxone to detox them, half of our opiates that they have been using. If it is, um, Alcohol, we will be using similar to Librium that they use in patients. And so then we'll also give um, supportive medication for their muzzle aches and nausea and uh, to prevent seizures and stuff like that. So they get all those medications monitored by a nurse. And at the end of the day, they get the last dose and they go home. They have been medicated uh, to their needs. So till the next day morning, they don't go through withdrawal and they come back. Uh, morning ready to get the next dose of medication so it makes it much easier most times my patient would tell me i slept like a baby when i went home so that kind of helps yeah that's really helpful and we have mastered this after um you know working with these patients for as i said this is my eighth year and definitely this model works pretty good um the patients that go through your program have they been through other programs before or there are a lot of first timers they've been through other programs what do they say about yours um, so they've, most of them, like I would say 70% of my patients have been through several uh, inpatient treatment in the past. And so when they come to my program, this is one thing I've always heard from my patients. They tell me like how easy it is to uh, come to the program and get what they wanted. And number two, they also say you don't get uh, treated like a number. You're not a number. You're a human being. Treat us the way we are supposed to be treated and we don't feel our needs have been neglected. And the third um, strong point that they say is that not only the, me as a patient, but also my family gets to hear the struggle that uh, we go through using and also kicking these drugs out of our system. So it's more so like a bridge between the family and the person. So they really like this model. You have um, 
you said I think your model, the um, the recidivism rate is what thirty percent as compared to fifty or sixty. What's the, the inpatient the, treatment, the results were like you know. Oh, so I gave you the positive one. It delivers better results when you compare to inpatient treatment. We give sixty five percent of our patients remain sober for over ninety days. When you compare that to inpatient, only forty percent of those inpatient uh, treated patients remain sober. When, when do people relapse and what events precipitate that? Is it like a big life event like divorce or loss of a job or is it just time where they seem to yeah, The relapse happens in many different ways. Um, so when a person comes for detoxification to our outpatient model, there is a, a thin boundary line because they're going back to the same environment where they've been using. So their relapse rate is pretty high in the first couple of days, but then their tolerance level has not gone down. So we are able to bring them back, show them where they made a mistake and uh, correct the whole, um, you know, environment and get the family member. If they had a fight with the family member, we would bring in and the family member and do the, you know, um, therapy with them so that the conflict resolution happens right then and right there. So going along with the course of treatment after detox, if they are in their partial care and if they have a relapse, we would like to see that as a lapse and not like a relapse. So they don't run with it. They come back and they work on this stuff and they tell us like, you know, if I'm a um, patient with um, heroin use, if the patient went home during partial care and had a glass of wine, we would still consider that as a relapse. And we would tell them like, listen, this is not your drug of choice. But then if you continue to drink, it'll disinhibit you, the impulsivity increases, and then you would end up using your drug of choice. So you don't want to do that. So we, we are able to kind of reason out with them and move them along the line of treatment. And then when they are relapsing in an intensive outpatient, that is a challenge because they are away from drugs and alcohol for a while and the tolerance levels have gone down. And that makes it riskier because um, they can overdose at that point in time. So what keeps it um, less of a relapse during intensive outpatient is the therapy and also doing drug tests on a continuum basis like you know they come in three times a week and we are working with them uh, you know meaningfully and that kind of shows them that they can stay away from these relapses and we tell them always relapse doesn't happen you know all of a sudden there are warning signs and so we teach them how to look for that when um when people fall back you know and they start using again do they tend to go to the same program or do they have bad memories associated with them go to a different program that was bad that you have more people that come back to you with other programs that felt bad about the experience. Most times the patients, um, you know, coming from other programs, what I hear from them is that I um, started using and I didn't go back to my program and they kicked me out. Uh, those are the kind of statements that my patients commonly come out and tell me. And I laugh at them and I tell them, if you're thinking that I'm going to kick you out, I will not. And they raise their eyebrows and ask me, what What did you say? And I say, it's easy for me to kick you out and it's easy for you to go out and use. But it's harder for you to come back and own up to the thing and, you know, be in treatment with you because that's what teaches you how not to relapse. And so they, they like that. So every time we have a relapse, we reason out with them. We sit down and ask them, what happened? You've been in treatment. You're doing good. So did you use any of these skills that you've learned? Did you put them into practice? Did you fight your relapse? Oh, I didn't. And so they kind of come to a self-realization and they say, gee, I should put what I learn, you know, into practice on a daily basis. Yeah, what are the main reasons you see that people relapse? Uh, poor coping skills. Um, don't, does not want to feel the way they feel. And, you know, if you really talk to any of these people who are using drugs, initially they enjoyed using drugs. After a point in time when it is like really uh, eaten up their day-to-day -day life, they become a slave to the drug, uh, lack of a better word. So that slavery really makes them want to stop using, but they don't know how to. So when they come seeking for treatment, some of them are already at that phase of life, and they would tell me, I'm tired of using, help me not to. So then it gets easy. So the, the honeymoon period is over, and after that, it's one big fight within themselves and with the family members. Hey, how long uh, are people addicts typically when by the time that they come to you? It all depends. Sometimes I do have uh, patients who would like find me online and they'll come in right off the bat and they'll tell me I've been using for the past couple of months. Uh, I, I don't think I'm in the right path and I want to stop. Uh, that'll be like 
very a handful of patients but then most of them would have had different kind of treatments and they they have not been treated right for example i have had patients who have been drinking and uh, gone sober for a few months and again uh, restarted drinking and then when i do the eval i always sit down with them and ask them what made them go back to drinking and then i slowly find out they had no anti craving medication they did not go for any uh, 12 step meetings and or they didn't have an individual therapy if they had some um you know problems going on in the family so based on what they bring to the table i kind of do the corrective measures when they start treatment with me and we go through everything and i always show them had you been on this particular medication and had you not had that craving you wouldn't be sitting here today this relapse been prevented and that you know kind of lights a uh, bulb in, you know what are what are some of the most important coping skills that you could describe one or two for listeners sure the coping skills are much common one is like frustration anxiety not sleeping um so all these stuff like they get frustrated because they're not sleeping and they they are awake when uh, when the family members are asleep so the very first thing that they want to do is either drink or uh, use the drug in order to cope with the situation so and and also anxiety they feel like i'm anxious i want something to cut down my anxiety right away i want instant gratification so what we teach them is like there is something that they can really work on which is the um, relapse prevention techniques identifying the triggers identifying their weaknesses their strengths and making that as a coping mechanism healthy coping coping mechanism instead of turning back to their uh, unhealthy ones that they've already formed uh, that really helps and go to the treatment program wherever they are at be able to sit down with the therapist and talk about their relapse in a meaningful way uh, instead of having to hide the details about their use i think that is the best thing that i can give as a tip for any listeners today being real as long as they are not hiding anything from their treatment providers they are making progress because the the trained ones know what to do but if the person who is struggling with addiction does not open up then it takes more time for them okay. any um you know you don't have to name names obviously but any cases that really stick out in your mind memorable cases or situations sure um once i was in my private practice uh, sitting across the uh, patient and i saw something green in the neck of the patient uh, right below the hairline on the side So when I looked at it I said what is that and then the patient goes um I use crocodile and it's something um that I inject into my veins and it turns my skin into this green uh, crocodile kind of a skin I was taken aback I thought it was a tattoo or something you know so I didn't even know what crocodile was at that point in time when I was sitting right in front of my chin and I admitted first thing I said was Oh, gee, I don't know anything about this. Where do you get this drug from? And took a crash course from the patient, and the patient did appreciate that I I didn't try to pretend that I knew everything. And I said I don't know. Um, you know, so I brought the patient back, and I found out that this was exactly like heroin detox. And so I reasoned out with the patient, and we we did the further treatment. So that was a learning thing, and it was. a multiple thing that went in my head like saying that oh my god i don't know everything run into these patients what they are using and how they are using this drug and what are the consequences how do you detox them so uh, that kind of uh, that kind of made me feel that i don't know everything but then there's so much more to learn in this field we as treaters can be uh, of any productive uh, you know citizen here is by being open accepting that we don't know certain things coming to terms about how to learn more about this and really keep up with the patient so that's one of the striking one that i had and to follow that i also had patients uh, who were 19 years who were using all the research materials which i couldn't even you know know remember what they were at that point in time they used to give me all those numbers like c19 and this and you know so i had to like learn again what were they and when they were using that salt i used to have patients who walk in and withdrawal symptoms and i wouldn't even know it looks like um uh, you know similar it feels like something else and they are like getting psychotic what's going on here, you know so it's a mixed kind of a bag that they present with and then we need to find out what what's going on it's like you know putting the puzzles together. so it's 
quite exciting for me and it's always a learning for me. I don't know even after working so many years in the addiction field I still don't know what's coming through the door so um not everyone in the world unfortunately can go see you so what do you do about uh, getting other centers set up or other doctors to do the same kind of treatment protocol that's worked so well for you um I have to admit I'm quite frustrated by the inertia of the inpatient model I believe that the outpatient model would catch on Uh, given its advantages but it has not caught on as fast as i thought but i do believe that the outpatient model to treat addiction is the future and will come to dominate treatment um so it because it lowers stigma and cost and improves the outcome so i think more and more having um outpatient clinic as an um, ambulatory detox across the state and across the country will really help over the stigma and be, patients can really get the appropriate treatment. Well, very good. So, again, for people that uh, could possibly see you, what areas do you cover geographically? And then I'll ask you for a resource for people that can't come see you, but, uh, you know, are not local. So, for local people, <laughs> what, where is local and how could they get in touch? So, I am in New Jersey and we have the first um, detox center, which was open uh, seven years ago in Middlesex, New Jersey. It's 333 Cedar Avenue, Middlesex, New Jersey. And uh, their number there is 732-560-1080. And then we also opened uh, an ambulatory detox in West Orange, New Jersey, which is uh, very, very much accessible by the North Jersey people. Uh, Middlesex is more for the Central Jersey and some parts of South Jersey can still go to my Middlesex center. But we are also in the process of opening one more center in South Jersey, which will be uh hopefully um open up this year in freehold so we pretty much have a good grasp of central jersey and north jersey at this point in time okay well very good and for people that uh, aren't local to you but want help what do you recommend they do what are some resources for them um i would say like they shouldn't uh, run away from their state they should first of all like you know try to stick to their local treatment centers and uh, go with the continuum of care as i said like do the detox work with their outpatient clinic and do um you know the step down treatment till the end of it instead of just taking bits and pieces like i just take the withdrawal management and then think everything is okay or you know skip the other modalities and just uh, go to a private doctor and see the doctor once a month those kind of treatment is not preferable so it's a chronic disease and one has to treat it like any other and i think having said that thing you know other chronic diseases like even hiv which is quite contagious have been largely treated as an outpatient basis why addiction uh, is directly like sent to an inpatient that's my question all the time and so i again and again i think if we make it as an outpatient more people will be able to access treatment because it's not as uh, cost um taxing for insurance companies and it's also like um, or integration of the family environment to their treatment. I I just had a a quick insight. I think that um it's inpatient based because I think a lot of people and professionals think of it as a psychiatric problem like you, you know you mentioned like lack of willpower or lack of want or you know a mental illness not even just a physical disease. So I think you know just like psychiatric patients may be you know committed towards you know old school model. I think uh, I just that's just my feeling that addiction probably is all the same path and that's why there's so much inpatient type stuff because of how it's viewed. That's just my guess. And no, right from the beginning, it was just, they, they didn't have any other model, Richard. They just had inpatient model and they used to do 30-day treatment, 28-day treatment, and insurance used to cover for those. You, they would go there and they'll remain so, but the longer you're in treatment, the better it is. And some people would go away for a year uh, and then they come back to their family. By the time the family has moved on without that loved one, being part of day to day activities so for the person who comes back it becomes very difficult for them to reintegrate into the into their own family you know lifestyle so i think the model has been what it has been and only now we are looking at more and more outpatient model and uh, you know the struggle as i said was whether it was a disease or not now we know we all come to consensus that this is a chronic disease and i i keep saying if we believe that this is a chronic disease treat it like any other chronic disease and you will see the success and uh, you know we also see criminal justice justice system jumping on this wagon you know so it's one thing they're taken away they've been put away in a structured environment 
and the criminal justice system is all over the map with them so it feels as if they are criminals you know but it smells like criminal mm. activity it feels like that but that that's not what it is and we need to like really work with this patient as a chronic illness we're well, very good with Dr. Sanami thanks so much for coming on the podcast i really appreciate it thank you You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.